Can Libya move on? It's the 10th anniversary of the uprising that would lead to Muammar Gaddafi's uh, march on Benghazi, the French and UK-led intervention that would signal his downfall, the ensuing decade that's been laden with tales of factional fighting, rival governments, proxy wars, and migrant tragedies. Now, a new UN plan raises hopes that Libya can reunify. Already, there's agreement on an interim leadership, a common currency, the reopening of oil pipelines. What will it take, though, to reach the goal of elections by the end of the year and a disarmament that's never happened? Some are nostalgic for Gaddafi's Libya, which was never a state like any other. It was kept together by an elaborate patronage system rather than a formal state apparatus. Others blame the current chaos precisely on that system and on Western powers available to help topple a dictator, but without much of a plan for what would follow. Ten years on, can a young, urbanized population take its own destiny in its hands? Today in the France 24 debate, we are asking if Libya can move on. Now, the day after those Western airstrikes started back in March of 2011, Anas El-Gamati was with us in this very studio. The director of the Sadek Institute joins us uh, from Istanbul. Uh, thank, you haven't aged a bit, Anas. How do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a long decade, but, you know, very, very happy to be back with the France 2014. All right. Great to see you. Uh, from Tunis, uh, Mohamed El-Jar, co-founder of the Libya Outlook Consultancy. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Uh, Jalal Harshawi is senior fellow at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Thanks for com coming in. And we'll be joined shortly by France 24 senior correspondent Catherine Norris Trent, uh, who is setting up in the capital Tripoli the France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. When the Arab Spring began with street protests in Tunisia, then Egypt, a lot of people didn't think it was surprising to see Libya and what the locals there call the revolution. Valerie de Kemp has more. February 2011, the Arab Spring Revolution spreads to Libya. In Benghazi, the country's second largest city, events quickly unravel with the detention of a man, Feti Tarbel, a lawyer and human rights activist. February 15th, demonstrators clash with security officers. Rebel forces take up arms against the regime. The pro-democracy movement quickly morphing into a full-blown civil war. Four days later, rebels gain control of Benghazi. Misrata Tobruk comes, will soon follow. By the end of the month, the uprising reaches the heart of the capital Tripoli and rebel forces form a transition council in their new headquarters, Benghazi. We're discussing the future of our country. Thank you. Gaddafi deploys the army, and on March 19th, the UN Security Council votes to impose a no-fly zone over Libya, enforced by NATO. Fighter jets from France, the U.S. and the United Kingdom begin bombing the country, countering Gaddafi's forces. But Gaddafi clings on to power as rebel fighters continue to advance towards the country's capital. August 23rd, they launched a massive offensive on Gaddafi's compound in Tripoli. The Transition Council declares victory, and so do Western powers. British Prime Minister David Cameron and French President Nicolas Sarkozy land in Libya to a hero's welcome. October 20th, Gaddafi flees to Sirte along with a handful of loyalists. His convoy comes under attack by NATO. He's found alive by rebels and captured. He later died of his injuries in circumstances that remain murky. Anas al Gamadi, uh, 10 years ago, uh, we were uh, quipping about it at the beginning. But when you look at that, that, that report, your thoughts on, on what Libya was like then and what Libya is like now? It's been a whirlwind of a decade. I mean, you know, I think prematurely many believed in 2011 that a short NATO-led campaign and a short war on the ground of, of, of several months 
would just yield to um, you know a new a new chapter in Libya's uh, in Libya's future. And I think that prematureness, I think, has, has now come back to haunt many Libyans. But I think it's it's interesting because you know there are certain moments that one can go back to a decade ago, especially especially the killing of Gaddafi and the way that that was done, and the alarm signs and the alarm bells that were beginning to ring amongst many people there. And then the need really to forge not only a consensus, but to forge reconciliation amongst Libya's population. And I think that's also one of the key themes that when I look back 10 years ago, I wish it had been done sooner. What could have been done differently at the time? I think at the time, actually, I would say that, you know, it's, it's, it's unusual to say that over a decade, it's been civil war. The first several years of Libya's transition were quite smooth. Yes, there were armed brigades. Yes, they were you know, they had frustrated the efforts of, of government and, this, and the society at large. But it wasn't the kind of civil war that we've seen over the last several years. The first three years, there were democratic elections. There was a peaceful transfer of power between the National Transitional Council and Libya's first elected parliament and government. Those were two really interesting signs. I think it was the difference in, in, in belief in the US and Europe, and particularly the UK and France, and that they could sit back and say, well, nothing has to be done here. The state infrastructure and the structures of the states required radical overhauling, and they needed real help, technical assistance on the ground. But the reality being is that Libya's, Libya's revolution didn't happen in a vacuum. There was a vision in Libya's revolution that was radically different to the entire region. You know, this kind of progressive move forward to build a democratic state, an oil-producing democratic state at that. And there wasn't done enough by the international community to inoculate that from other actors that would intervene later on that either had participated in Libya's revolution or had participated in the NATO operation, such as the UAE, or other actors that had slipped back to authoritarianism, like in Egypt. And, and the inability to inoculate their moves, I think, was the biggest mistake of the international community. And we found that that's plagued, really, Libya's transition over the last several years. Mohamed El Jar, do, do, do you agree, especially sitting where you are in in, in Tunis, which uh, Tunisia, one of the rare countries that has uh, succeeded in a democratic transition. Well, I think there are many people who are questioning whether actually uh, democracy has succeeded. Uh, in, in Tunisia, and democracy is not just about elections in the case of Tunisia, but it is about a system uh, uh, that has proper separation of powers, that has uh, uh, free media, and that uh, 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 a governance system that responds to the aspirations of the people. And recently we have seen widespread uh, um, yani, uh, demonstrations and protests in Tunisia, and also we have seen abuses. Uh, by the uh, uh, police forces here, and we have seen calls by people to actually correct the path of the revolution here in Tunisia. But uh, going back to uh, uh, Libya, uh, I think uh, there was naivety on the part of Libya's transitional leaders and also the international community that intervened to overthrow the Gaddafi regime in 2011. Uh, uh, and, and the problem was very obvious. A regime with all its flaws, was overthrown, and there was no replacement uh, for, 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 for that regime. There was no uh, replacement or a governance system that's able to govern in Libya. In addition to that, uh, Libya was left by NATO uh, in October uh, 2011 to millions and millions of pieces of weapons and hundreds of militias uh, around the country. Only for a few months or, or a year uh, after that, Libya became a safe haven. Uh, for extremist groups and for criminal uh, uh, networks. So I think that was one of the biggest mistakes. So it's a, it's a, it's a uh, tough one, Mohammed. The... it's a tough one then for the, the Western governments that uh, uh, cheerleaded or that in actively helped topple Gaddafi because at what point would they have outlived their welcome had they stayed on? No, the issue is not like that they, they have just left. France, for example, the first country to actually bomb the Gaddafi uh, forces on the outskirts of Benghazi, has actually been fueling the conflict in Libya, supporting uh, uh, armed factions that have uh, uh, for years now dominated the, the scene in Libya. Actually, French weapons, French intelligence uh, officers have been uh, killed in Libya. French weapons have been found uh, in, 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 in Libya. So uh, the Emirates, Qatar, these countries that have participated in the campaign to overthrow the Gaddafi regime are the same countries that have actually been involved 
in, 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 in fueling the conflict that has now lasted for, uh, for more than 10 years. So it is not, it's not just a case of the countries intervening to overthrow the Gaddafi regime and then leaving Libyans to their own devices. No, it has become, Libya became a theater. Uh, for the geopolitical uh, theater of competition for the geopolitical, economic, uh, and otherwise interests of these countries, the very countries that intervened to overthrow the Gaddafi regime or to change the regime in Libya under the pretext of protecting uh, 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 civilians in Libya. But unfortunately, these very same countries have since been engaged in a proxy war in Libya that has only escalated since then, and it actually reached new level where countries are now in, in intervening in Libya uh, covertly, where we have, uh, according to the United Nations, we have 20,000 mercenaries scattered around Libya, and we have 10 uh, military bases either fully or partially operated by foreign countries. And some of these countries are the very same countries that intervened in 2011 to overthrow the, uh, the, the, the Gaddafi regime under the pretext of a UN Security Council resolution uh, to, to protect uh, civilians. Jalal Harshawi, in the case of France, it was in 2011, you had uh, then-President Nicolas Sarkozy, who, who uh, had welcomed Gaddafi. Uh, we remember his tent being set up here in Paris on a visit where they rolled out the red carpet. Now, the same Sarkozy embroiled in a uh, campaign financing uh, a case uh, where it's alleged that Gaddafi uh, illicitly bankrolled uh, his presidential campaign. Uh, what do you make of that, of France's role in all of this? Well, first of all, I, I question the whole causality between the, the presidential uh, campaign financing and, and this idea that France would single-handedly decide on the intervention and pull much larger countries like uh, the United States and others like uh, Turkey and, and, and many other powers. That's impossible. I mean, there's a, a presence during that key month of February, which is the the American presence. I'm not talking so much about the White House of Barack Obama, but Hillary Clinton was absolutely crucial. She was Secretary of State at the time. Yeah, exactly, the head of US diplomacy, and she wanted that war. And Sarkozy always knew that if he were to go, he would benefit from this American framework with all the military power that, that comes with it. So the, this idea that France single-handedly was the leader is a fallacy that I would like to kind of demolish here. Uh, the, the, the Americans were, were key, and of course the Qataris and, and others. Um, and then in France also was out, was out of it. After 2011, the reason it came back on the side of Haftar in 2014 was because it was disappointed by how it was treated by the new authorities in 2012, 2013. Uh, so it's not a continuous decade. Yeah, and today, is France still supporting Haftar the way it was in 2014? No, no. 2000, I mean, June 2020, the, the, the defeat in, in, on the outskirts of Tripoli was a key moment. I would, uh, it's possible also that we will look at it June 2020 and realize that it's the end of the second civil war, the one that started in May 2014. Maybe it's the end. Because right now we have military presence, which is disturbing. But in terms of the amount of Libyans being killed every day, it's much lower since, 2000, since June 2020. So it was really a, a turnaround moment. France right now is hesitating. It doesn't really have a strategy. It's very disturbed by the presence of Turkey, and it's not sure that Biden is going to exert press, pressure on, on Erdogan to have him uh, leave the country. So you have all those outstanding issues, but France, I think, would, doesn't have really a strategy right now. All right, let's cross now to Tripoli. France 24's Catherine Norris Trent is there. Uh, Catherine, we were saying at the outset, uh, a bittersweet uh, 10th anniversary. You covered the conflict uh, at the time. Um, you just heard there Jalal Harshawi mention how perhaps uh, we are witnessing a turning point, though. Yes, perhaps. Uh, that is the hope that many people here on the streets of Tripoli definitely are harboring tonight. Right now, I have to tell you, you can probably hear behind me the, the horns blaring, there's fireworks going off. There are thousands and thousands of people, a lot of very young men, boys, out on the streets of Tripoli tonight, packing uh, into Martyrs Square. They 
are clearly out to let off some steam and out for a party. But when you speak to a lot of them, there is a feeling that there is a, a, a hope that they want to be optimistic in any case, um, that they, they believe perhaps it is a new turning point. Very high hopes going forward, um, perhaps impossible to meet for the new leadership that's been nominated. Uh, but they just say, you know, they've had enough of fighting, they've had enough of war, they've had enough of corruption, unemployment, all the issues that have plagued Libya for the past 10 years. And so a chance now uh, for many of them to come and express that tonight. It, it, it is difficult to wonder how these hopes aren't going to be disappointed and dashed. But, you know, a, a lot of people, whilst acknowledging the hardships they have suffered, they want to believe, and they, a lot of them, on the surface at least, want to come together. How that will translate into bringing together the different factions clearly remains to be seen. All right, and you've been speaking to uh, a lot of ordinary citizens in the capital. We'll pick up on that point when we come back with you, Catherine. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. I would like this country to do better. Things aren't great right now. We don't feel safe. Security is the most important thing. And we'd like to start our studies again. What's changed in the past 10 years is the freedom, freedom of expression. Today I can say what I want, when I want. I'm free. That was impossible for 40 years. We've paid dearly for our freedom. Ten years have just turned to dust and dirt. The government needs to blow all that dust away. Ten years of fear, killing, of people in need. All that needs to disappear. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. The 10th anniversary of the uh, uh, uprising that would eventually topple Muammar Gaddafi in Libya has us uh, focusing on the next chapter. After years of strife and at times a civil war, we're talking about it uh, with uh, Anas El Gamadi, uh, the director of the Sadek Institute think tank, who joins us from Istanbul. Mohamed El Jar, co-founder of the Libya Outlook Consultancy. Jalal Harshawi, senior fellow at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime is with us in the studio. And France 24 senior correspondent uh, Catherine Norris-Trent is in a noisy uh, Libyan capital, uh, Tripoli. Uh, Catherine, when you think back to covering uh, the, uh, uh, the uprising against Gaddafi, what the locals call the revolution, how different is Tripoli today? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Francois. When I first uh, traveled to Libya to report, it was when Muammar Gaddafi was still in power. So clearly things were extremely different then. I mean, just in terms of how journalists work and asking questions and people's fear to speak to us is extremely different back then. Um, but even though they did take us round to the, um, you know, pro-Gaddafi rallies full of people waving their green flags, there was always... Uh, someone who'd come and speak to us and tell us about their opposition and you know a couple of protesters who'd, who'd take the risk of, of breaking ranks so it was clearly still beginning to crumble and then when I came back through here uh, in August 2011 when the rebels pushed through um, to Tripoli uh, well clearly I mean that was a, a time of very intense war um, and nothing like the, the scenes we see today uh, where it wasn't fireworks you know, it was making the noise back then, it was heavy weapons. I do remember as uh, Gaddafi's compound was crumbling and the rebels finally pushed through, and uh, one scene that will always stay in my mind is these scores and scores of very young guys gleefully pouring out onto the streets of Tripoli with heavy weapons, RPGs, machine guns tucked under arms, carrying as much as they get, you know, carrying those weapons out of Baba Lazizia, Gaddafi's compound and other places and just thinking, you know, clearly this is this is not going to end very soon. And then over the years coming through that that huge joy that was on the streets back in 2012 in scenes quite reminiscent of the ones we're seeing now for the elections in 2012 and then a descent into, well, factionalism and chaos, basically. So this does seem more like the atmosphere of 2012's those hopes back then were rather short-lived and a lot of people here hoping 
that this time it can perhaps learn uh, last a bit longer. Let's talk about this time, the fourth time, in fact, that the United Nations has brokered a deal and with uh, expectations low, as our panelists have said, rival sides have already exceeded them. They've agreed to a new framework, a new leadership to take the country to December elections. Today, we have very good news in our search for peace. I welcome the selection by members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum of a unified temporary executive authority. And I call on all members of the dialogue and the Libyan and international stakeholders to respect the results of the vote. All right, a bit of geographical balance in the uh, leadership of that interim government. We have diplomat Mohamed Yunus uh, Menfi as interim council president, uh, the ambassador to Greece, who uh, we can show you uh, a few days ago in Benghazi. He hails uh, from the country's east. Alongside him, a well-connected billionaire businessman as prime minister, Abdul Hamid Mohamed uh, Debea, whose uh, family had ties to the Gaddafi regime. He hails from the western city uh, uh, of Misrata. Um, you're, you, it's been described in the international press, Anas al Gamadi, as uh, a pleasant surprise that uh, the two rival parts of the country have agreed uh, on this interim council. Do you agree? Well, I, well, I would say on the surface, that's, that's part of the issue. There is regionalism in Libya, but I think this is something that goes back to the source of the revolution. This is something that goes back to these visions that I mentioned earlier on. There is essentially two irreconcilable visions that still are uh, at play, that are still jostling at one another to try to find that primacy. And this is really kind of like the Iron Curtain that goes centrally down the line of Sirte, where today there are international actors that have deployed their mercenaries. And it divides not only the regions of Libya, but essentially the region, the, 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 the larger Middle East and North African region itself. I mean, Debeba and Menefi, these two new individuals, they are not part of the status quo that brought the, the country into conflict. The reason why we have this conflict is that Khalifa Haftar and his ally, Agela Salah, in parliament, rejected the last time that the UN brokered a deal between both sides. And the reason why they rejected that is that that vision does not concede to their concerns. Their concerns are that they want to take control of the presidency, of the state, the supreme commander of the armed forces, ensure that it does not tamper with the structures that they have designed in the Libyan national army that they established seven years ago. That is essentially the defining note of the political character of the state. Will it be a civilian-led state, a presidency that can take control of the army, or does the army take control of the presidency? And that's still the case today. We still don't know with President Menfi. We still don't know what his relationship is with Khalifa Haftar. Yes, there are images of him there shaking his hand, having met with him several days in Benghazi. But I guess just replacing it with a new name or from the same, same region is not enough. I think that central notion of the control of the presidency and defining the political character of the state is the root and the cause of Libya's conflict, and it will define its future. Mohamed El Jar, can can uh, this um, uh, can this lineup take the country to free and fair elections at the end of the year? I highly doubt that. I think it's it's near impossible to see Libya witnessing elections on the 24th of December of this year, as is anticipated or hoped, or as we are being told. Um, just a, a small correction, possibly, or or, or addition uh, to what Anas was saying. I think there is uh, indeed competition, but I will paint it in a different way uh, uh, to Libya over the last few years at least, is that we had competition between uh, a, a military or a military uh, uh, figure in Khalifa Haftar in eastern Libya who was hoping to establish a military dictatorship if he was able to control uh, the capital Tripoli. But then on the other side, you have militias or armed groups scattered also looking to uh, secure their own interest in what looks like a very chaotic environment uh, as well. So uh, you have a, a military dictatorship and then you have chaos uh, with the characteristics of militias, uh, 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 millions of, uh, of, of weapons scattered throughout the country and so on. And then you have a third current a third voice that truly believes in a Libya that has a constitution, Libya that has uh, uh, the rule of law, that respects human rights and so on. But unfortunately, 
with uh, the, the fact that both of the other sides are using violence, using guns, and they are getting support from outside uh, in, in, in the process, these voices that are calling for a civil, democratic, rule of law based Libya that respects human rights and, and responds to the aspirations of the Libyan people is lost. Some are saying that there is an opportunity with this government. Uh, the reason I highly doubt that is because this government is still subject to the same influence and the same pressure and coercion from the Libyan factions that have uh, led the status quo in Libya since 2011 until now, but also under pressure from, from the outside. So countries that are intervening in Libya, if they don't get what they want from this government, they will work to undermine this government. And the Libyan factions that are supposed to support this government and be part of this government, if they don't get exactly what they want, they are going to turn against this government and undermine this government. And I don't think that the international community, including the UN Security Council, has any tools uh, where they can deal with uh, uh, this dynamic that is, that is at play. So unfortunately, I do not share the euphoria of many uh, Libyans or some also in the international community that this government or the makeup of this government is indeed going to lead Libya to elections in, uh, on the 24th of December. There are too many hurdles and the same dynamics that fuel the conflict still exist strong today. All right, uh, let's, let's call up a map maybe just to show our viewers the defining, uh, dividing line for now remains Gaddafi's hometown of Sirte. Uh, and uh, uh, if you uh, look at the map, the split is uh, uh, plain to see there uh, uh, with uh, the uh, eastern forces and the, and, the, and the western forces that are uh, uh, at loggerheads. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, Jalil Harshawi, listening to uh, Mohammed El Jar. You agree that uh, the big problem there is the proxies on both sides, uh, the the outside players, the, the the what is it on in the eastern side? It's the Egyptians, the Russians, the Emiratis. On the western side, it's the Turks. It's uh, it's uh, you know that the, 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 these proxies are not going away. Yeah, they're not going away, and and I think everybody has a right to be shocked by that. But if you're if you try to be a real politique kind of person. You have to realize and acknowledge that the reason Libya is rather calm now is because of those external presence, uh, the, the external presence in the east. And I'm talking mainly about Russia and Turkey. You always, you still have the UAE that is still interfering and injecting weapons, but it's less powerful than uh, Russia and Turkey. And and what happens with these two, two Eurasian powers, is that they are broke. I mean, the, neither country is, has money to to throw at Libya the way the UAE does. And in fact, they're actually looking for money, which means that they're not interested in more conflict. They'd like to move on to the next phase. Which yeah, they, they, people have talked about this Astanization because they've had these conferences at Astana yeah. where they talk to each other while being rivals and it's all part of a grand game. Yeah, true, but Syria is a poor, broke country, whereas Libya is very wealthy. Uh, which means that when Russia and Turkey get, you know, sit down at the same table and try to basically find an arrangement, it's mostly about, about being rewarded, rewarded with big ticket contracts. OK, so on that point, the fact that they've agreed on the common currency, the fact that the oil pipelines, yeah, uh, uh, Marshall Haftar says they can be reopened. Yeah. What does that tell you? Well, th those are very important steps, and there are other steps on the economic front that needs to be that need to be accomplished over the next several months. But but this logic of of moving the conflict from from the military sphere to the economic sphere is uh, not necessarily good news, but it means also that it's less violent. It will probably be about uh, uh, it would start looking like a heist potentially if we're not careful. In the sense that those two powers will exert tremendous pressure on the new government to be rewarded in the form of contracts. And that could be also dangerous, but on the economic front. So the, the dynamic is changing, is what I'm trying to say. The dynamic is changing. Anas al Gamadi, you heard Mohammed El Jar's breakdown of the different uh, forces at play nationally. Uh, perhaps we can add another, which is those nostalgic for Gaddafi. And one of the things that's been pointed out and stressed is the fact that the new prime minister, Abdul Hamid uh, Debeba, he he has in the past had very close ties uh, to Gaddafi. There's even been speculation about uh, how close he is today with Gaddafi's son Saif uh, al uh, uh, Saif al Islam. 
uh, Qaddafi. Uh, is K the Qaddafi clan a big player in today's Libya? That's a very interesting question. I think to first answer the, the question about the Beba, the Beba is a deeply transactional individual. He couldn't be really described as a Gaddafist. He wasn't an ideologue. He didn't read from the Green Book. This is someone that made his billions and his, his family's billions were made in construction contracts throughout the latter part of the regime's time. And so I say that's where really where the Beba, given that he has kind of equal proximity from a Western uh, uh, city state like Misrata emanating from there, but also relationships to the Gaddafi clan, and also open relationships, I believe, even with Khalifa Abdus clan. He has that kind of equidistance to be able to manage those relationships, I believe, but it's not really his position alone that is important, still Mohammed Menefi's position. But to go back to your latter question in terms of how important is the Gaddafi clan, the Gaddafi clan has been at a crossroads now for several years. Uh, it, it went into wilderness following the regime's fall. There was really nothing there. There was no comfort. Most of their of their leadership uh, uh, went into exile. The sons were either in exile or being killed or had had been arrested. And so I think where where they they found themselves at this crossroads was around 2014. Khalifa Haftar emerged in 2014 and tried to try to co-opt many of the tribes that the Gaddafi regime had established its patronage structure around. Now. For many members of the Gaddafi clan, they look at Haftar cynically. This is a man that has been involved in several coups since 1969, had defected significantly over that period, and has launched coups you know, over that, over that half century. So I think in that sense, they look at Haftar as a traitor. He joined the February Revolution and then turned its back against it. So from that sense, there is no love loss between Haftar and the Gaddafi clan. There are rumors now that there are circulating between Sefer Islam potentially making a comeback. Those rumors have been there for many years. There's still no sign on the surface that he will. But I think that patronage structure is really at odds now today. And it's still at that same crossroads. Will it go with Khalifa Haftar and endure? Or will it go with Saif al-Islam if he's to make a return? But I don't believe that uh, Abdul Hamid Dabeba himself has the, ideological, has the ideological tools to unlock that patronage network. I think that's really Khalifa Haftar or Saif al-Islam today. Uh, would you say today, Mohammed El-Jar, that uh, Saif al-Islam Qaddafi is part of the problem, part of the solution, or irrelevant? No, I think um, after 10 years, I think many Libyans have started to realize uh, uh, that the only way forward is for all Libyans to be part of a new governance system. And let's remember that there was a purge uh, in, 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 in some form of former uh, Gaddafi regime figures. They did not really take part in the 2012 uh, elections. They also did not take part in the constitution drafting uh, process. And now there are calls for a proper reconciliation process to take place first and to address issues related to the constitution and to the governance system uh, that Libya should, uh, should, uh, should adopt. Uh, so in that sense, uh, my answer is he could be part of the problem where he could, where he has been seeking to form his own political and even armed wing, uh, but he could be part of the solution if there is a genuine uh, reconciliation process uh, uh, by the various Libyan uh, uh, factions, east, south and west, uh, 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 that would lead eventually to a constitution and to a governance system that's representative of the interests of the various factions that exist in Libya. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, I think all of that is being hindered and hampered by, uh, this is where I disagree with, with Jalal, by the foreign intervention that exists in, in, in Libya today and the superficial piece that, uh, 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 that uh, Jalal is talking about uh, could fall apart any, at, at, at any moment. And it is Libyans who will be uh, paying the, uh, the, the, the cost of that. Catherine Norris Trent, uh, in Tripoli today, uh, what do people think of when they look back 10 years and they talk about Muammar Gaddafi? In Tripoli today, obviously on the 10th anniversary of, of the 17th of February, you know, it's, it's pretty rare to find someone who will tell you openly and on camera that they're nostalgic about the rule of Muammar Gaddafi. Off camera, if you're having chats with people, you know, in, in a bit more of a behind the scenes where you get more of a glimpse of that um, and in other parts of Libya, perhaps to um, places like Bani Walid and Sirte, that might be easier to find. And there, there's this... Um, group of people referred to uh, kind of as the greens of people kind of nostalgic for that era. Um, what's more 
easy to find and very common. You know, just, just walking around central Tripoli is if, if you meet people and say, if you could turn back the clock 10 years, would you do it again? And you will find quite a lot of people who say, well, no, it was, it was too heavy a price to pay people who've lost loved ones, children in the fighting. Um, and there is a, a nostalgia for the stability uh, of 10 years ago before the revolution, despite clearly living under a dictatorship. And, so and Ka Catherine, on that, Catherine feelings. on that point, uh, if we do roll back the clock 10 years, we'll find images of you and France 24's Khalil Bashar sitting down with Gaddafi. It was on March the 7th, 2011. When you think back to that interview, what stays in your mind? The fact that there was a, a huge disconnect um, between what we were even hearing, even in a very controlled media environment in Tripoli at that time, and the answers, you know, when you ask Gaddafi, but what about, you know, the, the, this uh, uprising against you, this uprising, and he would just flat out deny it. Of course he would, but it, it, he just seemed extremely disconnected from the real, reality in the country. And I guess after 42 years, of ruling in a dictatorship, that's what happens. But there was a clear disconnect, and even the people around him in his entourage at that time, you could see the cracks there starting to appear. One of the government minders at that time, who was assigned to look after some of the press, you know, they'd, they'd let us work a bit more and go and see people who were sympathizing with the opposition. You know, th there were signs, people would say things behind the scenes. You could see the cracks started to come in and the huge disconnect at the top of the regime. All right. And 10 years on, uh, we can hear from those cars honking in the background that uh, they're certainly celebrating his downfall today. Uh, Catherine Nordstrand, I want to thank you so much for joining us live from Tripoli. I want to thank Anas El Gamadi in Istanbul, Mohammed El Jar in Tunis, uh, Jalal Harshawi here in the studio. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.